Um, it's a pleasure. I mean, first of all, you know, I was thinking about, I don't know, today I was sort of idly thinking about um, what's that expression like breaking the fourth wall, you know, like when Fleabag talks to the audience. And then I was trying to figure out what the fourth wall could possibly mean on Zoom. Like, is everything the fourth wall or is it all just or none of it? So I thought I would do that and just talk to all of you out there and as if there were no fourth wall, which I guess there isn't. Um, Scott, I should say, first of all, full disclosure, Scott's a friend, an old friend. We've been friends for like, what, 20 years, more? Maybe more. We were friends whenever um, Operation Shylock came out. For sure. And I, and also like the early days of The Sopranos, we were already friends. I mean, that's how we date our, you know, but also when I can't remember anything now, I say 20 years. Like I say, oh, yeah, you know, I haven't eaten a Big Mac in, it's like 20, in, year, in 20 years. It's like 20 years. Like 20 minutes from the airport. Right, exactly. So so we've been friends for, let's say, 20 years. Um, we live reasonably close together, just on opposite sides of the Hudson. But um, but it's a 45 minute drive. And um you know, if you're someone who doesn't go out of the house that much, which I don't, that's a big deal. So we're mostly friends on the phone. And we've been talking on the phone probably once a week for 20 years or twice a week sometimes. And Scott, you know, as those of you who know him know, is the funniest, um, smartest, endless source of good advice. And also a kind of, um, for me, a kind of moral beacon. I mean, that is every, there have been several times when, well, for example, once I almost crossed a picket line, a union picket line, back when there still were union picket lines, and I thought, what if Scott found out? So then I didn't do it. So so it functions for me that way. But I should say, too, that I was a fan of Scott's work before we became friends. I mean, I can remember reading Endless Love and saying, you know, oh, my God, how did anyone know they could do this? How did he know he could get away with this? And, you know, it was the sort of thing that, we all wish we'd written it. And um, and I read every book. I read every book since and with great pleasure. And and he has a marvelous grasp of character of what we might want to call human nature. And even and and he's a brave writer too. I mean, there are things about uh, human nature that he says that are very, very complicated, as complicated as people are. And now now that people seem to think that um that our jobs as writers is to make each other look good. You know, people look good. He doesn't always do that. So, so it's a kind of brave position that he's taking on again and again. And in addition, he's a fabulous sentence writer. I mean, you can pick up any of his books at any point and just open them at random and read some sentence that's smart, insanely well-written, true, funny, complicated, perceptive. Uh, and he's really an inspiration that way. So, and the new book, and he just keeps getting better and better. And the new book, um, can you all see this? Yeah. Well, you're probably seeing it backward. No, you can see it. Anyway, it's wonderful. You should all press the buy button even before we begin. Uh, but meanwhile, Scott, do you want to talk about the book and, and uh, maybe read from it for a while? Yeah, I'd like to do that. Let me uh, talk about it. First of all, Francine, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eo. I, I, I admired you long before I met you. And sometimes when you meet someone who you admired, it kind of comes into the admiration that this happily was not the case. We just loved each other right away. And uh, I think we, we, we were panelists for the uh, Penn Faulkner. And uh, we both wanted the same book to win. And we, uh, we always... Uh, always had so much uh, fun. So to have you say these things about my work is, is really uh, deeply, deeply meaningful to me. And, you know, I've had plenty of time to tell you how much I love your, uh, your, your books. You know, Mr. Monkey is just a total triumph. Blue Angel is just one of my favorite books. And, you know, and actually I just read, I, I, it somehow slipped by me, I just read your Peggy Guggenheim uh, book, which I thought was fantastic. I mean, Really Thank complicated, you. so simply written, so clear, but so complicated, you know, psychologically and morally, it was just a really wonderful, wonderful book. Um, so, you know what, let me let me read for a couple of minutes so you can just get used to being here and people who uh, are interested in what this book is about can get a little, a little sense of it. 
Um, I'm going to read something from, from the middle. And the narrator of this book has been in love with his best friend since college. Um, and he um, has kept this torch going for almost 25 years. And he is a, a, a gay man who's not out, which is in itself a very problematic thing to do in a, in a, uh, in a book because readers naturally, and maybe I have a bit of this in myself, readers naturally think that, that when you're portraying somebody, you're also sort of affirming their, their, life, their life and their view of things. And this man has a lot of great qualities and he's a very sweet guy and he's a very smart guy and he's an honest guy. But he has a streak of uh, what, what would appear to others to be cowardice. I mean, this is in a post-Stonewall world where he is not willing to let the world know uh, what, what his sexual preferences are. And he suffers for it. He suffers loneliness, he suffers deprivation, and he suffers a, a, a kind of shame. He works, he makes, he makes a, a good living. He makes an extremely good living. He works for an investment company. And in this scene, he's uh, checking out a, um, a, a company that, that makes the blades for the electricity uh, generating windmills. And he's been sent to, he's been sent to Amsterdam to discuss it with them. And He's at a party, it's around Christmas time. He feels terrible, lonely, longing for Thaddeus. And he steps outside and he says, the snowflakes on Fins and Rock were large and fluffy and seemed to ride the breeze, hovering over the pavement for an extra moment before dissolving upon landing. Through that dark Amsterdam night, a man emerged with his head down, wearing a watch cap, a long coat, and boots. An unlit cigarette was in his mouth. As he drew closer to me, I turned away, checked the roadway, pretending to look for a car that was on its way to pick me up. The stranger stopped and asked me if I had a light, and when I made a confused gesture, he asked me again in English. I decided it was no accident his stopping to speak to me. He wanted something beyond a light for his cigarette. In a burst of daring, I said, oh, sorry, don't smoke. That's good, he said, filthy habit. Oh, he said, I've got plenty of those. He laughed appreciatively. You're American, yeah? He said, guilty, he said. And then with 10 times the confidence I would ever have on native soil. I said, hey, you know what? There are matches in my hotel, which is about two minutes walk from here. In your hotel? Yeah, it's quite nice. My heart raced and rumbled like wooden wheels in the cobblestone. I'm here on business. I began to walk and he walked with me. I turned up the collar of my overcoat and he turned up the collar of his. He told me his name was Mayes, and he made sure I pronounced it correctly, Mayes. I wondered what he was like. There was a time when I could not stop myself from wondering who was packing what in their shorts. I had developed my curiosity into a kind of horny science, like so. Using a combination of my paid for personal experience, a time in locker rooms at various health clubs around the world and pornography, I had accrued a database of genitals, cut and uncut, massive and modest, chunky and sleek. And I had correlated this knowledge with certain facts about the owners of the genitalia to the point where I believed I could form a fairly accurate picture of what a guy was keeping in his equipment shed 
not only by the size of his fingers and his feet, but by his posture, his height and weight, Adam's apple and voice. Some of my theories were quite theoretical. Even for theories, they were theoretical, and I would have been the first to admit they might not stand up to rigorous testing. For example, I believe that blonde guys often had stout, furious looking penises, and that Slavs were never entirely flaccid and their members dangled in a kind of erotic indeterminacy, hanging midair like a windsock in a faint breeze. I told him my name was Christopher, but that most people who knew me called me Kit. I knew rightly. It was the first time I'd given my real name to someone with whom I was going to have sex. We made it back to the hotel. The clerks behind the check-in desk wore blue suits and beaten in mace, and I made our way across the lobby beneath the gaze of giant faux Dutch master paintings of 16th century burgers in various poses of self-possession with their neck ruffles and their arch little smiles. My key was waiting for me, saving me from having to say my name. Oh, the deep discretion of the Dutch and the deep discretion of high-priced hotels. It's that master of the manner treatment you pay for, more important than the room itself. I scooped up the key and the clerk and I gave that tight-lipped little nod men give to suggest the best of intentions. Very nice, he said, surveying my room. Permission to smoke? I tossed him the small book of matches that had been placed in a ceramic ashtray, and I pulled a split of Pieper Heidzik out of the nitty bottle. I love hotels, I said. Here my father-in-law rests when he comes for business, May said. Oh, you're married? Not so much anymore. Ah, yes, I said. I know, I'm in the same boat, recently divorced. Even in front of a stranger, a man I would in all likelihood Never see again after this night. I could not be truthful. The elation I felt when I gave my real name was officially over. I opened the champagne, the festive pop, the cobra curl of vapor rising. We did not toast each other or click the rims of our glasses. We just downed the champagne. And when our glasses were empty, I filled them up again. That's a pretty good cool. Okay. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. I'm hearing an echo. Can you, am I echoing just to myself or I just, oh, so, okay. I'm just going to go on echo or, or no echo. Um, so I was thinking about, I was trying to think about the various uh, themes and connections that tie your work together and tie the novels together and so forth. And, and I thought, well, the most obvious one was, was thwarted love. I mean, the most obvious, which has certainly been a theme through all of literature. I mean, the Greeks, you know, you either threw yourself in the ocean or turned the beloved into an animal or a plant or whatever. I mean, it's always been Romeo and Juliet. So, you know, starting with, I mean, with endless love of his parents and youth, and then it's been uh, race and marriage or marriage or race and marriage and, or class, there's always, issues of class, and now it's uh, sexual identity. So do you want to talk about that, about um, about how how that keeps morphing? And um, and also, do you think you're going to run out of ways to, for love to be thwarted, or um, do you think they're endless? Um, well, I'll start with the, I'll start with the second, the last part of the question. <laughs> um, I could run out of ways. I, you know, I'm not planning. I never plan to, you know, to do all the ways in which people can can uh, fail to connect or will be prevented from connecting. But you know, as as, as you noted yourself, it's it's a classic theme, and it's something that, for whatever biographical or psychological reasons, excites me wanting to be with somebody 
and being prevented from being with somebody not only excites me sort of emotionally, but it somehow triggers whatever that part of me is that makes language. I mean, there are a lot of stories that that interests me. There was a story of a, of a general who realizes he has he has fucked up so badly, and is it's because of him that people have needlessly died. I would love to read that book. I could not write that book. You know, I, I, I it may be that I have a narrow range and just you know like to work inside of it, but thwarted love and, and that kind of frustration makes me want to write. And, and, and it's also because there's a theme that's connected to it as far as, as, as the way it occurs to me. And that is the act of becoming, that, that, that act of shedding an old self and becoming a new somewhat heightened self. And that 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 quest for identity, that quest for self, that quest that quest for having you know somebody say you're okay, has always been super resonant for me. I remember maybe a couple of novels ago, maybe it was Ship Made of Paper, that you started reading Anna Karenina in the middle of writing, and you were you know speaking of thwarted great thwarted love stories and saying um, that it was very inspirational because it made you realize how much deeper you could get into the story or into the psychology of the characters. Or... You can, you can. I mean, it, I did, I, I read it. It could, it could really, it could really stop you from writing, reading Anna But yeah, I mean, he, he brought a lot of, uh, sort of psychological and political and historical and spiritual nobility to that story. It's always bothered me that there's a, there's certain kinds of stories that we, you know, who love literature have to one extent or another abandoned to people who don't really love literature. I mean- What do you mean? I mean that 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 love stories, you know, sort of have a, sort of have a kind of a down market feel to it to, to people, and they you know they think you know it's going to be a Harlequin romance or a beach read or you know something that 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 is like less than serious literature, and I don't I don't see it that way. I, th I think that. Um, you know, when people look back on their lives, these are the things that they, these are the memories, these are the moments, these are the things that happen to them that have the, the most meaning, the, you know, the, the connections between people, the, the passionate connection between you and another person, the sexual connection between you and another person. These are the things that, that you go through on your, on your deathbed, not... Um, you know, what happened in a uh, faculty meeting. <laughs> um, I, I mean, although, you know, we were talking about this a little last night, the, the, the way in which sort of the culture, I mean, speaking of, of love stories being taken over by people who don't really care about literature, the way in which the culture is sort of deforming the reading experience so that people expect to be either preach to or educated or bored even that that's fine being bored is like part of reading literature you're bored mm -hmm. so so and they're so distrustful i think of being pleased or god forbid entertained or engrossed or and that somehow you know one of the dividing lines between hot quote unquote high literature and popular literature is that i don't think high literature is supposed to engross you or make you want to know what's going to happen next. Whereas, you know, yes, that's know. what you want. That's what you want the reader to want. I know. I mean, there's certain kind of high literature that you're meant to fight your way into. And, and if it's too welcoming, it becomes suspect. 
you know, I, I, I get that because, you know, our, our, we're living in sort of like the toxic cloud of an entertainment culture, where, you know, when there's people trying to entertain us all the time and we, you know, it's, it's natural to become suspicious of that. But I think that there is a kind of, uh, there's a kind of deep, con deep connection that you can have to a book that really is uh, sublime. I mean, I'm not ever really content. I mean, my, my life always feels unmanageable if there's not a book that I can just sink into and feel that it, it's, it's my, my, my alternate world, my alternate home. And, you know, and it's, I don't read fantasy novels. I want it to be about actual human beings and I want it to be written, you know, with the highest sort of intention. Yeah, it's a. I mean, it's a complicated uh, equation because you want you want a book to be really well written. I mean, beautifully written, more than well written, and you want it to be to feel like it's for, let's just say, adults, whatever that means. But but you also, I also want to know what happens next. Yeah. I want to. I mean, you know, when I'm like when I'm writing myself, I always pretend like I'm the most attention deficit disorder person. Who I'll ever meet, and I've got to keep myself focused on the page because there are, you know, otherwise I'm like looking in the refrigerator, or what, you know, all the millions of things. Yeah, I mean, that's always been my goal. I, I, I want to write sentences that make you sometimes want to read it again. That sentence but also to write with a sense of propulsion that keeps you there and makes you want to keep going and find out what happens. And, you know, they're not mysteries. They're not really, they're not suspenseful, but that you have a kind of, uh, you have skin in the game, that you care about these people and you care about, you know, what they're, what they're dealing with. And I think it's true of any art form. I mean, the other day I was trying to figure out what is it that makes you watch, you know, a TV series till the end and what makes you check out after episode one, maybe if you, and, and always it's that same, like caring at wanting to find out what happens to character, to the characters. I mean, you have to be that involved in their life. Okay. So there's another question about the other theme. I thought the slightly less obvious theme going through, which is, uh, the danger, the terrifying danger of um, of Im impulsivity. I mean, every book, or almost every one I can think of, that's that's like the character flaw or something in the character that just that just flips it, that makes things go wrong. I mean, all you know, you can track it through all the books. I mean, Man in the Woods, which is one of my favorites. Boy, that's like major impulsivity. But the others all have that to a, yes. to a more or less degree. With, with, with Thaddeus throwing that drink in someone's face and it ruins his career. Yeah, thank well. You. Thank you, John O'Hara. <laughs> thank you, friends of ours. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I never thought about that, Francine. But I, 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 as soon as you said it, I, I realized it's true. And, you know, it's, it's that, it's that self that we keep inside of us, you know, it's, it's civilization and it's discontent, you know, which I always thought is the sort of the, the intellectual underpinnings of most of my work, of what we must do to be able to live in society and to be able to live an adult and productive and reasonable life and the price that we pay for doing that. And some, and, and you know, there's, there's a sense of restraint and self-control and sometimes you let it go. And it's a moment that upsets your life and could even destroy your life, but it's also a revealing moment. It's, it, it's the, the lights go up to their highest intensity and you see things 
about yourself if you're the person who's lost control or about the person you, you're watching that you would never have seen otherwise. You would never have seen otherwise. Yeah. I mean, it's so true to experience too, because when you think about how much of, of just daily life is, is like moments of, whoops, I shouldn't have done that, you know, right. or oops, I shouldn't. But, but mostly, fortunately, those moments have minor consequences, you know, like, oh God, I hurt someone's feelings the next day I'll apologize, blah, blah, blah. But, but in your novels, they have major consequences. Yes. Major consequences. Right. Well, you know, there's stories and you want, you, you, you want to turn up the heat. You, you want, to, you don't want to serve things lukewarm. And, you know, I'm always, um, I mean, I'm probably often treading the line between literature and melodrama. And sometimes, you know, I might slip over in, into melodrama because I want things to happen and I want things to happen that are consequential. And, uh, you know, I'm not writing Henry James, even though he does write things that are consequential, but they just take a very, very long time to, to, to happen. Yeah. And you might not even know that they happened your first time through. But um, I think, you know, the life as I've lived it and life as I observed it has been sometimes rough and sometimes confrontational and sometimes, you know, extremely dramatic. And that, that interests me, that, you know, that... Uh, you know, when people have to make choices, when people have to be held into uh, account for what they've said or done, when people have to clean up their own mess, when people don't get to live, live the life that they wanted to leave, when, you know, the, these consequences of our acts are are interesting to me as a writer. Yeah, I would. I I guess about a month ago, I read. Maybe I reread. I don't know if I reread it or read it. Jane Austen's Persuasion. And I was talking to a friend, and, and I don't know. I mean, I loved it, of course, but I was complaining about some little things that happened. And my friend said, oh, I've always loved this book almost the best because, because it's when Jane Austen acknowledges that you can ruin your life, that you can ruin your life or almost ruin your life or right. ruin your life and so forth. And and I think, again, that's sort of a brave, um, a brave stance to take. And, and write about because we all want to believe that everything can be fixed. But mm -hmm. one of the, one of the things your novels are very clear about is that there's some things that just can't be fixed. That you, that once you do it, you know, you set fire to your girlfriend's house, or you kill a guy in the woods who's been torturing a dog, or I won't say any spoilers for the new ones. But but that you know that they're not fixable. There's some there are moments of lack of control or emotion or something where something takes a turn and then the, the character has to live with that turn. Yes, but sometimes not all that unhappily. I mean, sometimes it completely screws up their life, but they would look back and say, I would do it all again. Because even as you are erupting, you are living sort of a truth that is so incandescent that it, it, it becomes like your your greatest moment, even though it's come, it destroyed you in some way. Yeah. So do you want to talk about revision? Because I read this book in an earlier, a much earlier uh, iteration. And then when I reread it in galleys, I guess, I was struck by how much you changed, you know, and, and, and well, let's just say toned down in some major ways. So how does that happen? Or how did you do that? Or why did you decide to do that? Or... It, you know, I, I think I almost always do that because I never really know where a book is going until I get there. And then <laughs> I can look at what I've got and read it as a reader rather than as somebody who's trying, you know, sitting down. I mean, I mean, I work literally every day and I work for hours every day and you, you can get lost in it, you know, and you need, you, I mean, I need drafts. 
I need several drafts. I need probably four or five drafts. And then I need someone to read it. I need a few people to read it because, you know, it's it's like I don't really know what I look like in the mirror. Other people would know better than I do what I look like. But, and I take all that seriously. And, and, and frankly, I like doing that work. It's, it's the only part of writing that I would consider pleasurable is rewriting and, and rethinking. In this particular book, I think I made the biggest change between the penultimate draft and the final draft that I've ever, I've ever made because I think that I've been living with these characters for so long because some of these characters appeared in my previous book that I was just in a kind of almost froth of, of, of ending and, and it was going to be end like a Shakespeare play with basically stage completely littered with bodies. And I came to my senses and, <laughs> and wrote a different ending. And, and now, frankly, you know, maybe because it's the newest part of the book, the ending is my favorite part of the book. So, you know, in that case, I was, I was lucky to be able to revise. You know, there was, there was something that, 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 that haunted me throughout the, the composition of this book. And, and and that is you know and I that that is writing from the point of view of a closeted gay man, and you know from, I, I don't identify as, as as gay, and and we're living in a time you know when everyone's going to keep to their own lane, and and people are are worried about having their stories appropriated and worried about appropriating other stories. And, and frankly, I think that these are legitimate and important and interesting and potentially very liberating concerns. You know, on the other hand, that was the only way that I could write this book because I wanted this book to be about somebody who loved Thaddeus. And that's who loved him. And so once I made that decision, I, I, I just had to accept that I was gonna be writing from the point of view of a, of a gay man. I thought in the beginning that Kip would be more like a Nick Carraway type and, and that the book would not really be about him. And in, you know, it would be about Gatsby, in this case, Thaddeus. But the more I wrote, the more <coughs> Kip took over. And I just became more and more interested in, in him and his story and his voice. And now it's it's really, really his book. And you know, whether I did a credible job of uh, channeling a gay man to tell this story, uh, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I hope I did. But, you know, I'd be lying to say, you know, it, it, it didn't occur to me and, it, and I didn't keep on revisiting that in, in my mind. And would I have worried about that 10 years ago? I don't know. But you certainly, you know, in light of the discussions that we're having now as a society, you'd be foolish not to have that conversation with yourself and not know that, that, that there's, a certain, there's a certain onus that goes with that and that you have to accept. Have any of your books been written from a female point of view? I don't know, right? No. 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 I've had... Just asking. I, <laughs> Just asking. I've had, I've had sections that have... <laughs> So, you know, one of the things I love about your novels and about literature in general, and it's kind of a great thing about teaching, too, is that um, the characters, they turn into human beings. I mean, they are human beings and you start to think of them as human beings. So I, I guess what I want to ask is, what do you really think about Thaddeus 
the love object of this novel and the, pro, let's say, protagonist of the previous novel. Very complicated character and and very complicated character. And I, I don't. I was curious what you thought because it because I thought you know, it's such a complete picture of a person, but not, but someone who's desperate in so many ways. And and we're supposed to feel. I don't. I think we're supposed to feel sympathy and compassion for desperation. But it doesn't. But it's that's not always true. We don't yeah. always feel that way. And that's. You know, and that was interesting to me about the novel, too. Well, you know, there's one thing to say. He was desperate. He just wanted people to love him. He was frightened. He didn't always know what he was doing. And you can feel sympathy for that, you know. But because I actually sort of drilled down into those feelings and we watched him doing these things, the more he expresses those emotions, probably the more disturbing and the the less uh, the least uh, I mean sorry the less attractive he becomes. I mean this is a tough question for me because I know that people don't like Thaddeus and are rooting for Kip and people say oh I've had Thaddeus in my life and he was the worst and I kind of like him. You know, I, I, I do I do like him. I see a lot of myself in him. And you know, you take you take your worst trait and you fill it up with language which becomes a kind of a helium and it gets bigger and bigger and, and it becomes something else, but you still you know, you still know that the germ of that was something that, that you share with, with that character. And you know, I tried to give Thaddeus excuses for feeling the way he did, you know, the sort of loveless parents and who never really uh, took to him, who thought he was sort of a dummy, and uh, and he's like probably raising another man's kid without fully knowing that he is. But no matter how many things I could put in there to make him sympathetic. I know that people just aren't really, uh, are, are finding him kind of maddening. And he's sort of the villain of the piece. And I never, I don't see him that way. Well, I wouldn't say the villain. And, but all, you know, but again, he just seems like a human being. But, but as I sort of said at the beginning, there's this expectation now that we are writing about, that we're like angels writing about angels. Yeah. all the time and that's it doesn't really work for me so i like you know i mean he was he was perpetually interesting because partly because i couldn't figure him out or say he was this or that or one thing or the other i mean i knew in a way i knew i knew the way you know about people the way his situation was affecting who he is or was and the way that that can change it I mean, the way you think you're one kind of person and then your situation changes and you, then you become another kind of person. It happened. Yeah. Well, at one point, I mean, maybe this was some sort of sublimated suicide that I, I was getting so peeved with him that I had a character kill him at, at, at a certain point. Just, you know, well, I just threw that away and and res resurrected him. He's... he's uh, He's difficult. He has, but uh, what, what all he really wanted was for people to like him and to have big parties at his house and have everybody look at him with affection, really. And you know, but that has that has some ingrained in that there is something toxic and awful mm -hmm. about it because it's the it's it's a performance. And people don't want to be spun like that. I get that. And I'm not like that. <laughs> <laughs> no one said you were. Right. So, yeah. so could you read a little bit more and then maybe if there are questions, we'll... Okay, yes. I think I've chosen... This is actually perfect to, for what we've been talking about. Because is, there's a moment when... They've, they've, they've really been going through the muck of Thaddeus's life. His parents have uh, died and 
He's very worried about is he going to get any money from them. Um, and there's a moment when Kip almost snaps out of his long infatuation. It was as hot, they're in Chicago. It was as hot on 55th Street as it was in the store and nearly as foul. A road crew, all of them sweating profusely, was making rushed repairs to the street, slathering tar onto the surface like army medics, patching up, a wound, patching up the wounded with super glue. The sky was filthy gray and trembling. University of Chicago students, slender and tan and seemingly oblivious to the threat of a storm, glided by on their bicycles. It was six in the evening, and from somewhere nearby, a church bell rang the hours, each peal reverberating in the heavy air. I know it's wrong to ask, Thaddeus said, but I do wonder for whom the bell is tolling. I smiled, but I was not amused. From someone no longer an undergraduate, and given the circumstances, the joke seemed pretentious and pathetic. Thaddeus shifted his gaze toward me and tried to ascertain whether my smile was genuine or forced. Oh, how he needed that little droplet of dopamine that came from human approval, his drug of choice. He had sweated through his shirt, his deodorant, and the last vestiges of his beautiful youth. He was as rank as an abandoned old man. I avoided his eyes and felt something odd and unprecedented. I don't know how to describe it. <clears throat> it was fleeting. It was as if I was wandering around a house I knew as well as my place on earth and suddenly found myself in a cold, unfamiliar room. What was this room? Who was this man? It was not just a mental sensation. It was physical, too. I could feel love wilting, crumbling, dying. I didn't actually know if love was dying or if it was me. I was not going toward the light, but toward darkness. I wondered if I ever really loved Thaddeus at all, or if I'd spent half my life, life caught in a lie. I told myself. He sensed me slipping away, my failure to laugh at his joke or to meet his gaze. Something alerted him. His nervous system reacted to the tiniest titrations of human attention and his need to be liked, loved, included, appreciated. Oh my God, it was bottomless. He put his arm over my shoulders like a 10 year old boy nominating you to be his best friend. A smell like rust and onions emanated from within him. My own fragrance was probably no less repellent, but we, re but we forgive it in ourselves. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So Melanie, are there questions? I can't read this little script on the side. Maybe you know, you can. Yep. Um, so there's just a, a couple questions so far. Uh, one is from uh, John Esco. It says, who's better, Scott or Goethe? <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer that. <laughs> I've only read Goethe in translation, so, you know, it's not fair. Right. Otherwise, I could answer. <laughs> well, Scott, because he's alive. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the other question is from Barbara, and it says, other than his most recent novel, does Scott have a favorite of his own? That's a tough one. I, you know, I'm, I really like um, a novel I wrote in the 90s called Men in Black, which um, unfortunately came out right around the time that Steven Spielberg was released, you know, was, was he directed or somebody directed? There was this huge smash movie. Science with, fiction. Uh, science fiction movie called Men in Black. And, you know, it, it, it's, it threw its, uh, I mean, that was like 
a, a taste of the pandemic for me in, in, in the 90s because it was a hugely successful. It was Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones, right. So, but I like that because I think it's, I enjoy humor and somehow have a hard time generating it when I'm writing because I need to be with people to feel humorous. So my books aren't as humorous as I would like them to be, but Men in Black is, is close to a, a, a pretty funny book that uh, as I've written. Okay. Um, so uh, what has over your career drawn you to writing novels and not short stories? Well, um, I've tried to write short stories. They just, you know, and I have written a, a couple. Um, I, I, I'm just not, I'm not that economical a writer and I just don't, think in terms of short stories, we, and, and when I tr have tried, they, they, they just get bogged down because I'm sort of interested in all the layers in a, in a situation, and it just takes too long for me to get to the point to, to, uh, to, to write a short story. I, th I think it's very different. I mean, Francine can do both, and there are plenty of writers, I guess, who, who who at least try to do both. Francine succeeds in doing both. I mean, Philip Roth, well, I guess he stopped writing short stories pretty early on. But you know, Hemingway did both. And I don't I don't think Scott Fitzgerald's short stories are that good, but a lot of people do both. But I, I do think it's a different skill. I mean it's certainly a different structure. Also I, I just I love I love the security of working on a novel and knowing day after day, week after week, month after month, what I'm going to be doing. And uh, that, that my settings are there, my characters are there. And that, that you know, I feel sorry for short stories writing because they're always sort of starting from scratch every couple of months, you know, they're having to set up a, a, a new world, but you know, they might enjoy doing what do you, I mean, you, you you don't write stories. You haven't written a story in a while, or have I missed one? Or yeah, I did. Well, I did. You know, I had that crazy job for Gagosian Magazine writing those art short stories, but that it was different because that was like an assignment. So it wasn't as if stories were generating myself. But mostly, I was writing stories when my kids were little, and my attention span was shot. So. You know, I, and I would just, I couldn't, I didn't have that kind of time that I needed to be, to write novels. So, you know, I could stop and start. But I don't know what the, you know, people say, like, how do you know if it's going to be a short story or a novel? Well, if you get 30 pages in and it's the end, chances are it's a short story. Um, yeah. But, Yeah. But you know, then the, some of the greatest writers only wrote short stories. I mean, right? You know, many, many, and many great writers, like right now, only write short stories. So, yeah. Well, Alice Munro never wrote a novel. They tried to sell one of her books as right. if it were a novel, but it wasn't. Yeah. Goethe never wrote short stories. So that's all, the, that's all the questions we have from the audience, but I'm wondering if both of you might want to talk a little bit about what you're reading now during the pandemic. I'm reading The Romance of American Communism by Vivian Gornick. And it's, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I'm interested in American communism. Um, and so the subject matter is is compelling to me, and but this it, it's sort of field work for her. I mean, she's just going around the country, talking to communists and and getting their view about what their experience had been. But 
you know, I was thinking, try to support my local bookshop. And during this pandemic, I probably bought 20 books from them. And I've read 15 pages in each of them. And there's just this, I'm having a hard time, you know, keeping my concentration. Unfinished books. And then, I mean, I, for a while I was reading Patricia Highsmith because I thought, well, if she can't hold my attention, nobody can. But then I would, but then I would get, I would get like, halfway through a Patricia Highsmith novel and I would go, yeah, I know that this psycho is going to murder this completely innocent person and I just don't care. I don't care. And I would just stop, you know, but, but my reading's been all over the map. I mean, it's all the way from like, uh, as I said, Jane Austen to British. Mi I've, read, I've read a lot of books by Brits, British mysteries. And then I, for a while I was really into like, sort of British house novels from the 1930s and 40s, which, you know, but but also, I don't know about anybody else, but I've had my, I mean, the pandemic has done nothing for my insomnia. So uh, a lot of what I read is like, what can hold my interest at three o'clock in the morning so that it kind of narrows it down. So, I reread White Noise and that actually worked. Really? Yeah, it was. You know, because it's it's super funny, you know, and that that sort of keeps you buoyant uh, through it. There's stuff about white noise that sticks. You know, it must have been like 15 years since I read it, and it's indelible. I mean, the airborne toxic event, and well, then wow. teaching Hitler studies. I mean, you know that that our son said it's always Hitler studies in our house, Mom. I mean, that you know, like Hitler studies. Yeah. So there's, uh, we'll have one more question, one more question from the audience from uh, Ken Miller. He says, could you say a few words on writing about sex and how that's changed for you over the years? Well, I, I, I wrote a lot about sex in Endless Love. And, and there's like, a, I don't know how many pages, it is, but they, I think it goes on for 35 or 40 pages, just one act of uh, one sex act between two people um and for the most part that said everything i have to say about that subject but because you know i remain interested in characters who are sexually attracted to each other there are there are moments of 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 sex but i i handle it you know, much more glancingly now than than I I did because you know quite frankly I don't think I left anything unsaid about that about that subject and I don't think I could ever write anything that good about that subject again and my interest as I age becomes more focused on other ways that the heart expresses uh, it, it, itself. You know, those, that, I'm not really writing about uh, people in their late teens, early 20s anymore. I'm writing about people who have uh, <clears throat> much more complicated life. And they, they may feel the sting of sexual betrayal and feel the surge of sexual uh, attraction, but it's an avenue towards something else in their lives, whereas it's not really the case with the younger characters. I have one more quick question. Um, it, just because it's been bothering me. When, you're, when you try and write anything now, are you conscious of, of that you're writing about an old world that wasn't that isn't the world anymore. And, and you know, if a novel, let's say, appears in the post-pandemic world, would necessarily be a kind of artifact of something? I don't know. I mean, I was just trying to write a scene at a crowded party. And I thought, I don't know, reading it now or thinking about it now just seems like, you know, I might as well be writing about a chariot race in the Coliseum or something. You know, it just yeah. seems so distant. I like that. 
uh, you know, I mean, that, that we're, we're the keepers of those memories and we're the keepers of that world. I mean, I think, we, you know, like every generation has its own New York. So we're, you know, we're, we carry that with us and, and we portray it and people know it. I mean, I'm interested in reading about the world of Edith Wharton. So right. like, people can be interested in, you know, I, I started writing something and I said, well, this could actually not happen now. They, the, 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 what these two people are doing could not happen. Certainly not now and, and maybe not forever for all I know. So I just, you know, was clear that it was 2014. And when, when you could do those things and I, I think that you know, you, you can't be everything, but you, you, know, you can you can set your books in a, in a world that you know, and I think that that's you know valuable. I mean, I mean, the world of Goodbye Columbus doesn't exist anymore. Those kind of Jews don't really exist. You know, the diaphragms don't exist. <laughs> But it's still really compelling. Somebody's probably got a refrigerator full of fruit somewhere. It was actually cherries. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody who's here, whoever you are, thanks so much for coming by. Thank you so much, Francine, for. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Center for Fiction. Long may you flourish. And thank you both, uh, Francine and Scott. It was a great conversation. Everybody use that button right there to buy Scott's book if you haven't already. And um, hopefully our paths will all cross in the real world soon. So thanks, Scott. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.